Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start the webinar in two to three minutes. I'm going to go ahead and put up a poll just to see how many of you have used the SRA toolkit before. So in the next minute or two, if you guys could respond to this poll, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, with uh, about 72% of you voting, actually 76% of you voting, I think we have a pretty clear idea of uh, the proportions. So about 80% of you have not used the SRA toolkit before. At the end of this session, I'm going to put up another poll about what webinars uh, you guys would like to see on this topic in the future. Um, and that includes both more advanced as well as, or rather simpler webinars on this topic. In general, if there are any webinars you guys would like to see, please email us at webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. Well, hello again, everybody. Thank you uh, for coming to the webinar, and thanks to those of you who uh, responded to the poll at the beginning. For those of you just coming in the door, there will be another poll at the end, and we would greatly appreciate it if you could respond to it. If you need closed captioning, it's just a little bit silly to say this, but please go to this URL and enter this code. Uh, all the content, uh, including a video recording will be able available at this URL that will be closed caption. Please use a question pod to enter a question when you think about it. Questions that are not immediate technical questions will be answered at the end. So today we're going to talk about configuration and use of the SRA toolkit. This is really a very efficient way to get data out of the NCBI, SRA, and dbGaP databases without moving a whole lot of data. And that's something I'd really like to focus on today, is the idea of getting genomic data without and information without moving a whole lot of data. I'm going to talk about five basic topics today. First, the biggest problem we find that people have with SRA and dbGaP at NCBI is finding the actual data. So I'm going to spend a few minutes, probably five to ten minutes, demonstrating how to find the data in a very efficient way. After that, I'm going to talk about downloading and configuring the SRA toolkit, then downloading data sets with the SRA toolkit, uh, and I'm going to move on to a little bit more advanced facet of that, which is really streaming parts of the data. That's the way we really like to see most people use SRA and dbGaP data. And finally, at the end, I'm going to talk about genomic analysis with BLAST. I think this is a really exciting topic because basically it democratizes genomics. If you can do a BLAST search, nowadays you can do genomics. I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with basic BLAST searches. So on to finding the data. As many of you are probably aware, uh, if you search in SRA for a particular data set, you get many, many entries. This is because of the way our entree system works. However, in SRA, you can find things um, by faceting the data, uh, as you can see on the left side of your screen here. And also, you can link in to both our metadata repository called Biosample, as well as a repository of aggregated uh, data sets aggregated into project called BioProject. Personally, I feel you would get to this page just by clicking on the public BioProject, uh, the 12 icon on the right side of your screen right here. Personally, I feel that BioProject is the most efficient way to get into genomic data at NCBI. This is also uh, capable of faceted search. Uh, you can facet on a bunch of things. Here, all of the data is in SRA, so you can click on that. However, if you were looking for RNA uh, seq data sets for a particular phenotypic condition, you'd probably want to click on transcriptome and SRA, which would give you transcriptome data sets. Here, for NA12878, who's an individual from the Thousand Genomes Project, I see 12 results. 
If I scroll to the bottom, one thing I see is the Next Generation Sequencing Standard Reference Materials Project. And some people also know that project as Genome in a Bottle. If you're familiar with that project or you want to use it further after I describe it, it's also available uh, on Amazon Web Services. So if I click on that project, what I'm able to see is the SRA experiments as well as BioSample. For other bio projects, I might be able to see things like nucleotide, geo data sets, as well as PubMed articles uh, and those that have been deposited into PubMed Central. So if I click on the number 68, sending me back to SRA, I'm able to see 68 runs. What the Genome in a Bottle or Reference Materials Project is, uh, is a couple of people from the Thousand Genomes Project that have been sequenced many, many, with many different technologies, as you can see here. If I click on the Send To button and expose the dropdown, by the way, I would like to say at this point in general, please, when you're searching NCBI, never underestimate the Send To button. Typically, there is a wealth of information that can be downloaded using this little button in the right, on the right-hand side of the screen. One of the exciting things that I can select at S SRA is the run selector, and I can go to the run selector. This is very nice because it shows me a lot of both technical as well as biological metadata about the samples and the runs in this particular project. Faceted search here is also possible on the left, and I can filter by biosample. So this is one particular individual, once again, NA12878. Uh, and I can select just whole genome at, as well as whole exome sequences, which I've displayed here. So one of the nicest features of the SRA run selector is that what I can do here I'm just selecting the whole exome sequences for this individual. What I can do is I can download an accession list uh, from the uh, individual runs in SRA of whole exome sequencing from this individual. And later on, I'll show you how we can use those to stream data automatically out of the SRA. Going back a step, and thinking about SRA in terms of aligned data, one thing I can do that's very useful, say I wanted to just look at a gene in SRA, uh, say I wanted to look at part of APOE. I could go to APOE and I could look at a gene table. With that, I can see the coordinates for all the exons as well as the coordinates for the gene in general. Later on, I'm going to show you how to implement a search like this on the command line to take data slices out of hundreds or thousands of SRA records. Before we get to that, I'd like to show you how to look at that on the, on the web. So if I go to um, the SRA page uh, underneath one of the NA12878 records, please note that for this particular exercise, that's something that has to be aligned. Um, and I select that particular range. I can look at it in a sequence viewer. If I zoom in, I can see the actual reads with particular variations. And in this case, I can see that there's a position. This happens to be an intron in APOE with a head. So uh, some of you might find that particularly interesting. So why do we have SRA? Well, for one thing, because we have several petabytes of genomic data in both public SRA and dbGaP. SRA format allows us to compress this data up to threefold. Additionally, it allows us to establish a columnar database of both aligned and sort of in unaligned sequences, which allows us to both grab data regions, grab slices out of many of these data sets, as well as, I'll show you later, we can blast into them extremely quickly. 
Here I've shown an example of a command for the SRA toolkit, and I will show you this in more detail later. Here you can SAM dump just a slice. This happens to be BRCA1, the BRCA1 gene region, uh, from this particular SRA uh, run, and I'm sending it to a file. Up here, I've displayed it in a standalone genome browser that NCBI distributes called GBench. One of these days, we'll probably have a webinar on the GBench product. Before I show you how to configure and use the NCBI SRA toolkit, I'd like to take a brief foray and describe uh, what dbGaP is. For those of you who have a lot of familiarity with dbGaP, this brief foray should only take about 90 seconds. So dbGaP is the database of genotypes and phenotypes. For those of you who are knowledgeable about American regulatory, pol regulatory policy and legislation, you know that individual human uh, genomes cannot simply be made available to the public when correlated to particular phenotypes. Uh, so we've developed an access system for being able to go to those. So if you're interested in particular dbGaP data sets, principal investigators can apply for access to the data. These applications should only take the submitter about 20 minutes, and they should be able to get access to a huge wealth of data which combines phenotype and genotype. So the number of genomic samples uh, in dbGaP uh, now exceeds 1 million, and I believe this is as of November, as well as the number of individuals exceeds 800,000 individuals. So there are a lot of people in dbGaP with phenotypically linked data, and if you and or your principal investigator are interested in these types of data, I would strongly encourage you to search uh, for phenotypes of interest in dbGaP. A principal investigator would simply click on request access uh, via authorized access and assuming that there is no IRB protocol uh, involved and the data access committee doesn't have additional questions, uh, access is typically given within two weeks or a month. What types of data, what type of data is in dbGaP? Uh, most of our uh, Genomic data, excluding GWAS chip data, is exome, but that is getting smaller relative, even though dbGaP is getting bigger very quickly as a whole, that's getting smaller relative to whole genome as well as whole transcriptome data. Uh, one highlight of that is the GTEx project, um, which is a very exciting project uh, getting RNA-seq data from many different individuals in many different tissue types. So we've already talked about uh, why we have SRA, but the data slicing feature is very nice because it allows for extremely rapid identification. Uh, for example, as I'll show you in a couple of minutes, you can generate pileup format very quickly for a group of samples, and this can be compared to another group of samples. For example, you could compare a group of breast cancer cell lines to a bunch of individuals in the Thousand Genomes Project. So this is the SRA homepage, and on this homepage there's a couple of things I'd like to point out. What I'm going to walk you through in a minute is downloading the SRA toolkit. Uh, also, we've recently updated the documentation. The documentation for the SRA toolkit is quite good. Uh, I showed you the run selector a little bit earlier, and I'm going to show you a little bit later, speci more specifically, how to use those accession list files. And finally, once again, uh, I'll show you at the very end how to use SRA Blast. Again, this is for everyone. Everyone can get access to SRA data through Blast, regardless of technical skill level. So for those of you who are not command line savvy, um, SRA BLAST is probably a good option for dipping your toes into genomics. However, uh, if you want to do more sophisticated analysis, it will be necessary to 
collaborate and or learn to how to use command line features. So this says downloading the data, which is the general section here, but this particular slide covers how to download the actual SRA toolkit. Personally, I can typically get this downloaded and implemented very quickly. The screenshots I'm going to show you, um, the actual configuration is done on an Ubuntu machine, and uh, the actual data downloads are done on a CentOS machine. Uh, there's no reason that you should really see any difference. After you download the SRA toolkit, you're going to want to use the simple command tar-xvzf uh, to go ahead and open that up. And we'll open it up into a directory like this. What I like to do is establish a variable that is equal to that directory and always run this out of that variable. The reason for this is because we update the toolkit every few months, and it's good to know exactly which version of the toolkit you're working with. Also, unless you're recapitulating the uh, methods that are put forth by another paper, I would always suggest using the most recent version of the SRA toolkit. Before you use the SRA toolkit, I would highly suggest recommend configuring the SRA toolkit. The next seven or eight slides are about configuration. So what you will want to do on your system is use the command VDB config I. Once again, configuration is recommended if you're doing SRA analysis, highly recommended if you're doing a lot of SRA analysis, and really uh, very important if you are analyzing read data from dbgap. So this is what the configuration screen looks like. The first option I'd like to talk about is number two. If you're interested in getting only one or two slices of data out of each SRA record, then what I would do is to disable local file caching. You can do that simply by pressing the number two in the configuration menu. So that will not cache the data sets on your system. If you do decide to cache the data sets for a variety of reasons, it's important that you change the default import path. The reason for that is you don't want to put data somewhere where it will fill up a hard drive. For example, if you were using Amazon Web Services, you don't want to put data in the core volumes of what you're doing, you would like to put that in the peripheral EBS volumes. So typically that will default to public and you can move that around. You can use a mouse or the arrow keys to navigate around in this menu. You can create new subdirectories using this menu. This can be very useful. Typically, I would do this if I was configuring this for dbgap. So what I might do is within this directory, make a master directory called dbgap secure. So within this directory, I would have subdirectories for my different dbgap projects, and I would want to make sure that no one else had access to this directory because I've said that I would not share this data with anyone. The other thing I can do is import my encryption file into that dbgap master directory in one of those subdirectories for per project that I discussed. This allows you to use the SRA toolkit seamlessly just like you're using it for public SRA. Let me say that again. If you correctly import your encryption key into a dbgap directory and then you put all the dbgap data that you're using for a specific project in that directory, you can use the SRA toolkit just like you'd be using it for public SRA. So it should be fairly straightforward to get data out of dbgap. So when I'm done with that, I can set my default import path for dbgap, and then for that, I can 
move data. I can also import my encryption file automatically. Typically, I will have downloaded that from the internet into a particular directory and using this tool, I can move the file over into my default directory. SRR, uh, this particular SRA area. And I dump it into BRCA1.sam. So this command simply takes a matter of seconds and then I can look at my SAM file. Here I see a SAM file. It comes with a header and just a SAM file, a regular SAM file for that particular reason with its associated metadata and so forth. It's important to remember that this should only be done for aligned data sets that are in SRA. This should not be done for unaligned data sets. Although there are other tools in the SRA toolkit, like FastQDump, which can be used for unaligned data sets. So now I want to move on to streaming the data. Now that I've been able to download data sets, I can loop over these data sets in order to get slices out of many projects. If you will remember, uh, if I select an SRA uh, site from Entree, I can click on the Run Selector. This will allow me to go back to this faceted search within the Run Selector. Uh, this is a group of breast cancer cell lines, and I can select particular types of metadata and then highlight the ones I'm interested in analyzing. So for a small group of basal carcinoma, I can go ahead and pop out an accession list. This is a downloadable text file that will download to a location that I specify. What I can then do is run a simple for loop over this list. I know this is a little advanced for some of you. Don't worry about it. I'm going to come back to blasting into SRA in a minute. What I can do is run a simple for loop where I'm running the same command that I showed you before with the same aligned region and dumping it into a series of SAM files. This is very quick and takes less than a couple of minutes for a bunch of data sets. What I can see is that having looped over uh, this particular file, I produce a whole bunch of SAM files. In some more advanced options, what I can see is that I can do that, loop over, see it, but then I can also do the same for pileup. And so I can make uh, a bunch of pileup files here. So I can output either to SAM files or pileup files. And then I can use some of our more advanced options. So I can use an advanced option called option-file, which allows me to loop over that into one particular pileup file. This is pretty awesome. If you think about it, because what I can do is take a whole bunch of runs and use them to make a big pile up for particular positions. So that's a really neat thing. Um, also, I can make an aligned file. Um, I can make a text file of aligned regions and I can uh, search multiple regions. So here I'm searching the BRCA1 locus as well as the APOE locus. And finally, I can combine those analyses simply using a for loop and the options, uh, 
the option dash file flag. So those are more advanced things. Don't worry about it if you didn't understand that the first time. If you use this stuff for a couple of weeks, you likely will understand it. We've also, for these more advanced options, we've now written a software development kit, which allows you to do many of these things automatically rather than writing for loops. Um, there's a whole bunch of little modules for you to do this type of stuff. So this is the front page of the API. This provides a very nice readme and some examples. You can also get this out of the NCBI NGS GitHub repository. And here you see that you have examples in Java, in Python, uh, as well as C++. Some of the Java examples are really neat, particularly as there is a Java example which feeds data directly into Spark and allows you to calculate camera lengths uh, directly from that data. So once again, the repository is NCBI slash NGS. All right. For those of you who did not understand the last five or six slides, I'm now going to talk a little bit about blasting into SRA. Once again, blasting into SRA allows anyone to get into public SRA data. There's really no barriers of configuration. That said, if you're going to expand your analysis and do an entire project, you are probably going to want to learn to use the options I've shown you above or collaborate with a bioinformatician who can do so. However, for doing preliminary analysis with public genomic data sets in SRA, it's as simple as doing a BLAST search. So what you can do is find some SRA data sets. These happen to be mice infected with influenza A for about seven days. You can select some of the data sets and send them to BLAST. So once again, using the Send To module, selecting BLAST and pressing Send. This will open up a normal BLAST page and in a GUI way, you can paste in your sequence and it will have the SRA records by default. Hit BLAST and in a couple of minutes, you'll be able to see your particular, uh, whether or not your particular gene of interest is represented or well represented in that data set. For those of you who are a bit more technically savvy, BLASTN VDB is available on the command line and can do many of the same things. So, as I said at the very beginning, at least I believe I said, I really wanted to keep this webinar to about 30 minutes, such that there would be time for discussions and questions. Before we start the discussion and questions, what I would like to do is share with you a second poll where I ask you about future webinars in this topic. And once again, if you have any questions about things in the webinars or if you have suggestions for webinars you'd like to see in the future, please email webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. I'm going to launch the poll now. We're going to have the poll up for about 60 seconds, then we'll come back and take questions. All right. Thank you for those of you who voted. Many of you were very interested in either a more advanced webinar on SRA or a simpler webinar on SRA. And so we will very likely have those webinars in the near future. So thank you very much for voting. Um, I'd now like to open the floor to questions. And with me today, I have Adam Stein, who is a member of the SRA group. Um, and probably has been in contact with many of you, uh, particularly if you do SRA submission, as well as Peter Cooper, who is the head of the NCBI Education Group. So once again, I will start taking questions at this point. Uh, the first one is, what is Spark? That's Apache Spark. Um, it is a very fast way uh, to do MapReduce. 
So please feel free to go ahead and Google that. Uh, good question. Are VCF files available? Fantastic question. If the records have been genotyped, then VCF files are available. And you can also take slices of VCF files. This is particularly common for dbGaP data sets and dbGaP data. So if you're interested in that, it would be, I think, extremely valuable to watch the dbGaP data browser webinar that we're offering on March 18th. Also, for some of the other dbGaP data sets, there are VCF files which are directly downloadable. So what qualifications are needed to access dbGaP? Typically, you have to be a principal investigator in a lab. That lab does not necessarily have to be academic, but basically you need to demonstrate that you are a principal investigator or the equivalent and also write a short explanation of why you want to use the data. Uh, for using the SRA toolkit, uh, there is no authentication step unless you're using dbGaP, in which case you really need to move the decryption key into the directory in which you have your dbGaP data. So the next question is, if I wanted to get access to very large SRA or dbGaP data, what problems or issues should I be worried about? And I'd really like to take just 20 seconds to address this question, to say that if you want to download many terabytes of data, this could take quite a while. If you absolutely must have the entire data sets, I would suggest trying to leverage Aspera, uh, downloading an Aspera client and using that. However, really, by and large, most people don't need all the data at one time. Even if you want to look at a large amount of slices, if you go back and review the material that we've just gone over, I think you could probably figure out a clever way to use a bunch of slices in parallel. And I'll give you an example. We were able to call all of the SNPs in the Thousand Genomes Project in the matter of a few hours. And the way we were able to do that is by doing it 100 megabase pairs at a time. So you can take small slices and run them in a very parallel way if you have access to a farm or something. But thank you very much for the question. It was a good question. So if you're analyzing TCGA data, please remember it's, it's important to remember that we no longer host TCGA. Uh, that's hosted at NCI now. Yeah, that's hosted by CG Hub. But I think in terms of how much bandwidth you would use uh, in terms of analyzing CGA or TCGA, that's something you need to work out with your provider. But what I would again reiterate is that if you move small data slices instead of big data files, that's really going to reduce the amount of bandwidth you're using. So anytime you do any of this stuff, you're going to move data. Even within the cloud, you're moving data. You're always moving data somewhere. And so I think it's important to try to minimize the amount of data you're moving. So the next question is, in my experience, not all SRA files are available for blasting. Is this correct and why? And that's a great question. So previously, the only ones that were available for blasting, the only SRA files, were those that were unaligned, uh, because you can look at the variations in al aligned files very easily, as I showed you. Um, and also, we didn't include solid runs and a couple of other sequencers. I've spoken to the BLAST group, and they are moving towards trying to make all SRA areas blastable. Most of them should be available now, and I think right now the last thing we're working on are the aligned files. Someone asked, is it possible to download FASTQ and or BAM file of a specific BAM file of a specific SRA? Absolutely. And you can I highly recommend you use the SRA toolkit for that as well. Uh, you can use something called FASTQ dump, or you can use something called SAM dump and simply use SAM tools to move it uh, into a BAM. That said, this is typically not the most efficient way to do analysis, but if you must, just check out the SRA Toolkit documentation 
totally a possible thing to do. Um, and you can also do it through the web using Aspera. Again, somebody asked uh, if we make recordings. Uh, so the slides as a video will be available probably within two weeks from now, um, and they will be closed captioned. Also, a flat file of the slides themselves may become available very shortly on the NCBI Education FTP site. That's FTP NCBI slash pub slash education, and you can dig down through there. Uh, the F link to the FTP site is also on the webinars page. Uh, someone asked what Aspera is. Aspera is a very fast file transfer system. Uh, in their words, they would say it's uh, at least tenfold faster than FTP. Um, so somebody asked if you can pipe from SRA SAM into GATK. I'm not sure you can. Uh, one thing I know you can do now uh, is go from SRA into HiSET, the new RNA-seq mapper. But I will check on the um, whether you can get from SRA into GATK and get back to you, especially if you can pipe uh, smaller regions. It might be useful. Uh, one hack you could use at this point is uh, to just take slices and pipe them to BAM and then pipe them straight into GATK. Uh, but I'll check and see if you can do that directly. Thanks for your question. Uh, so for more information on Aspera, as well as a bunch of other things, you can go to www.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov slash public. Uh, that'll give you a bunch more information on that type of stuff. So the next question is going to be fielded by Adam Stein, and that is, is the number of spots, the number of reads for a specific run? That is the number of spots that would have been on a flow cell if you're talking something like Illumina. And in, the, the, in that case, it's, it's literally a spot on a glass plate. Now, that spot for paired end run may represent two distinct reads, and so the number of reads could be higher than the number of spots in the run. When we store a spot, we will put both forward and reverse reads together, and then on output, we split them back apart. So someone asked if uh, people have issues with downloading SRA files, um, then them getting corrupted in the middle. Um, and I would suggest that such things can happen any time you try to move huge data files in their entirety. And so I would highly recommend that what you do is move slices of the data that really, really prevents that type of thing. Uh, the address for the public site again is ncbi.nlm.nih.gov slash public, P-U-B-L-I-C. The dbGaP browser webinar I mentioned is going to be on March 18th, I believe also at 1 p.m. EST, although it may be at noon. Uh, what I would suggest is that you check the NCBI webinars site. If you Google NCBI webinars, it will pop it up. I will show that here. So here is the NCBI webinar site. The dbGaP data browser webinar that's coming up is certainly on March 18th at 1 p.m. And finally, uh, I would like to show you the public site. So this is the public site. Uh, with that, I think we've gone through the vast majority of questions. Uh, there are a couple other minor questions, but uh, we will get back to you on that. So uh, with that, I believe we're going to sign off once again. If there are comments or questions, please email us at webinars at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, or if you have specific questions for me, my email address is ben.busby at nih.gov. Thanks a lot for coming. I hope everybody has a great day, and we'll hope to see you at a webinar soon. Thanks again.